Assalamu alaikum and a very warm good afternoon to everyone present here. I, Mahilika Abrar. Assalamu alaikum and a very warm good afternoon to everyone present here. I, Mahilika Abrar. I, Tanya Pandey. The penultimate year students of law would like to welcome you all to this momentous event. Before commencing with this noteworthy occasion, I would like to call upon stage Mr. Yusha Hafizur Rahman to facilitate bringing up the curtain on today's program with the invocation guard of the holy verses from the Holy Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Indeed, Allah commands justice, kindness, good conscience and the doing of good to kith and kin and forbids all that is shameful, evil and oppressive. Surah Nahl, verse 90. And now, it's time for me to introduce you all to a very special guest for the event. It's a matter of immense pleasure and prestige for me to acquaint you all with a highly distinguished and eminent personality from the realm of judiciary a sitting judge at the Supreme Court of India, a person who started his legal career as an advocate at the Allahabad High Court and subsequently served as the permanent judge of the respective High Court and then as the Chief Justice of Punjab in Haryana High Court. Everyone out there, please welcome with a big round of applause on Bill Mr. Justice Krishna Bharati, sir. I would like to request Dean Professor Normani, sir, to welcome the guest with bouquet of flowers. I would like to request Professor Normani, sir, to welcome Justice Aditya Nath Mittal, retired judge of the Allahabad High Court with bouquet of flowers. Now, I would like to request Ms. Laiba Fatima to welcome Mr. Ashwarya Pratap Singh, sir, the Chief Judicial Magistrate of Aligarh with bouquet of flowers. Lastly, I would like to request Ms. Mantasha Sultan to welcome Aman Alam. Yes. Lastly, I would like to request Ms. Matashansa. Sorry for the confusion. I would like to request Ms. Mantasha Sultan to welcome District Judge Babu Sarang Singh, sir, with bouquet of flowers. Moving ahead with the program. For a personality as distinguished as that of Honorable Justice, few words of acclaim wouldn't do justice. But still, I would attempt to provide a brief introduction of his lordship. 
His Lordship's tenure as the judge of the Supreme Court has been nothing short of an inspiration. Be it his finesse of dealing with cases, or be it his punctilious approach in ensuring that not even the fiddling details of the case miss his attention. His entire career has been embellished by some of the most remarkable pronouncements he made in the realm of land acquisition, criminal law, constitutional law, and more. One of the most significant ones incorporate the judgment he delivered in the case of State of Uttar Pradesh versus Ravindra Singh, wherein he prohibited gender determination tests which were quite, uh, quite uh, instrumental in fostering the ill practice of female feticide. The another one was the judgment in the case of Pramod Singla versus Union of India, wherein a bench comprising him observed that preventive detention laws are a colonial legacy and have the capacity to confer arbitrary powers on the state. And hence, there exists a need of critically analyzing them and using them only in the rarest of the rare cases. Furthermore, having had the privileged opportunity of interning under his adroit guidance, sirs, dexterity in dealing with a melange of cases, his empathetic demeanor towards young lawyers, and his capacity to maintain a calm disposition even during times of adversity has been stupendously sublime and something I wanted to inculcate in my own personality. And so as to welcome his lordship, I would like to call upon another gem from the realm of legal fraternity, Dean Professor Dr. Mohammed Zafar Normani, sir. A fearless, diligent, dedicated, compassionate personality. To describe so with his adjectives would be an understatement. Professor Normani, sir, is an overachiever and is a man way ahead of his time. Sir specializes in ecology law and intellectual property rights and is engaged in teaching and research work since the last 26 years. He has collaborated with the World Bank and Ministry of Environment and Forest Capacity Building Projects in Environmental Law in India. I would like, I would request Professor Nomani, sir, to welcome the guest. Honorable Justice, Honorable Mr. Justice Krishna Murari, Honorable Mr. Justice Adityanath Mittal, my brother chairman, the district judge, Mr. Babu Sarang, Mr. Swariya Rai, ladies and gentlemen, dear student, it's for me, it's a proud privilege to welcome his lordship Honorable Mr. Justice Krishna Murari, after assuming the office of the Dean within a week, Sir, you are here in an institution which has been nurtured by and founded by Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, the modern architect of the modern India, has been the member of the Legislative Committee. And he piloted Waqf Act, Hilbert Bill, Indian Contract Act, Society Registration Act, Epidemic Diseases Act. So our founding father of this institution have in legal and checkered history, and his son, Justice Sayyid Mahmood, happens to be the puny judge of the High Court of Judicature at Allahabad. Sir, your lordship, this faculty was founded by Justice Duklak Estrate, and the first teacher which was appointed as the principal of this law college, which started in 1891, was Dwarkanath Banerjee, advocate Allahabad High Court. And then it was taken over by Malvi Karamat Hussain. So this edifice or the architecture of this building may not be soothing to you, but it has a very long history. Justice Mahmood, who delivered very landmark judgment in Gopal Pandey versus Pushottam Das, in Ishwari Rai versus Gopal Sharan, Muhammad Allahabad versus Ismail Khan, and embellished the Indian legal system and the judiciary by his meticulous judgment and adorable citations. Justice Shah, Shah Suleiman, your lordship happens to be a physicist, a mathematician, a judge of par excellence combining law and philosophy together has been the judge of the federal court from 1937 to 41. I feel very privileged to welcome your lordship to this august institution. Thereafter, Professor Hafizul Rahman, Professor Shiv Dayal, Professor S.K. Agarwala, Professor Tahir Mahmood, Professor Virendra Singh Rekhi, Professor Fazan Mustafa are some of our notable teachers 
which we ha we feel very elated to be associated with this institute. The Holy Quran says, "Pastamai rafa wa zal mizan, Allah tadkul mizan," which means the heaven the Lord raised is imposed with a balance that you not transgress the balance. I am quoting Surah An Nahl of the Holy Quran. Inna Allah ya amru bil bil adl wal ihsan. Indeed, Allah orders justice and good can chance. Is the holy verses from the Holy Quran. For me, the Indian Supreme Court, I see with the definition, yato dharma stato jaya, which means where there is a dharma, there will be victory. And I feel that you symbolizes the very logo of the Supreme Court by your innumerable judgments. I'll just, with the paucity of the time, I'll just refer to the two judgments which you have just rendered day before yesterday. The one judgment is of very seminal significance pertaining to the national capital territory versus Union of India, wherein your Lordship have says that it means to reconcile the desire of the commonality along the desire of the autonomy and accommodate diverse needs in a pluralistic society, recognizing regional aspirations and strengthens the unity of the countries and embodies the spirit of democracy. A student of constitutional law and federalism must take note of the hues and colors and shades and opinions of Honorable Mr. Justice Krishna Murari on, on the decision delivered just day before yesterday. I further quote, he writes, thus in any federal constitution, at a minimum there is a dual quality and there are two sets of government operate, one at the level of national government and, and the second at the level of the regional federal unit. These dual sets of the government elected by we the people in two separate electoral processes are dual manifestation of public will. The priorities of these two sets of government which manifest in federal system are not, not just bound to be different, but are intended to be different, quote unquote. I salute your Lordship for having rendered such a landmark judgment before just coming to Aligarh Muslim University Aligarh. In another judgment of far-reaching significance, known as Desai versus the Chief Secretary of State of Maharashtra, your Lordship has observed to hold that it is a legislative party which appoints the whip will mean severance of the umbilical cord within the political party. It means the group of MLAs can disconnect from the political party. Whip appointed political party is a crucial for 10 schedule. The bench further states that the bench remarked that the speaker was aware of the emergence of the two factions in the legislature party on 3rd July 2022 when he appointed the new whips. And then uh, I'll, I'll just quote the pithy paragraph of this judgment, which carries a lot of importance after the pronouncement of uh, Govind Pant versus Raghupul Tilak. And it is, speaks about the constitutionality of the powers of the governor. I think after Keshwananda Bharti versus State of Kerala, after Har Gobind Pant versus Raghupul Tilak, your judgment in case of the Maharashtra is a landmark judgment and I, I, I just want to salute once more sir that you set the tone and tenor of the Indian federalism which should be based on diversity not of whims and caprices. With this remark I say I just quote the couplet of the fast of the Firas to you Ke ruke to zamane I dedicate one couplet to you uh, in my welcoming address, in the light of these two judgments, Ruke to Gardishe Uska Tawaf Karti hai. Ruke to Gardishe Uska Tawaf Karti hai. Chale to Usko Zamane Teher Kede. Ruke to Gardishe Uska Tawaf Karti hai. Chale to Usko Zamane Teher Kede. Suna hai bole to Bato se pool jarte hai. सुना है बोले तो बातों से फूल झड़ते हैं ये बात है तो चलो बात करके देख
Thank you very much, sir, for the beautiful welcome address. Essentially, the functioning of the FX score of the nation rests substantially in the astute minds of judges who are instrumental in determining the future course the country of ours would take upon. His lordship judgments is a manifestation that the judiciary is the torch bearer of the fundamental constitutional principles. Now, I would like to call Mr. Aman Alam, law clerk, come research assistant at the office of Honorable Mr. Justice Krishna Murari, sir, to share his thoughts and reminiscences. Honorable Mr. Justice Krishan Murari, Judge Supreme Court of India, and the Chief Guest as well as the keynote speaker for the day. Honorable Mr. Justice A. N. Mittal, former judge of the Allahabad High Court. Professor M. Z. M. Nomani Sahab, Dean Faculty of Law. Professor Muhammad Ashraf Sahab, Chairman Department of Law. Professor Zaidi Sahab, in charge Law Society. Do Dr. B. Sarang, Honorable District Judge Aligarh. My respected teachers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear friends, Assalamu Alaikum and a very good afternoon to you all. It's always a pleasure to be back here in my alma mater to share my thoughts and views with you. And particularly this day is a great honor for us due to the august and esteemed presence of Honorable Mr. Justice Krishan Murari amongst us. I won't take much time of yours. I've come here to share one or two memories about uh, my five year period in the faculty which lasted uh, till last year and uh, one or two thoughts that I have, uh, one or two inspirations that I have drawn from his lordship. First of all, uh, when, when I now look back at the five year period that I spent in the faculty, some particular values that I gained from my respected teachers in the classrooms the the values that I gained apart from the classrooms, I found them to be very much important in life. The values of punctuality, the values of sincerity, that many a times uh, we often tend to ignore in the classrooms, I find them to be greatly uh, important in life. Secondly, uh, one of the things that I enjoyed the most was uh, the seminar library and its rich collection of old manuscripts dating back to the 19th century. I really enjoyed uh, reading them uh, in, in my surplus time. Thirdly, uh, a, pa a few months ago, I happened to be here for the final uh, round of the intra moot court competition, and I had uh, said this uh, thing back then as well. I'm going to reiterate it, that uh, back in our days, we used to explore right from the first year of law. We used to explore all areas, all arenas. We didn't use to restrict. But unfortunately, what I have been witnessing for the past few months since last year is that uh, many of the fresher students that I interacted with tend to be uh, in their very first semester they were inclined towards one particular field and they were asking me uh, the question whether we should pursue internships in some other field whether we should pursue extracurricular activities for some other field so I would say till your third or fourth year it is a time to explore explore as much as you can and it, it should be only in the fourth year or by the end of your fourth year that you should have a constrained approach. Secondly, I would, uh, towards the end of my words, I would like to say that uh, I would like to pay my gratitude, although this is a very small word, to, to Honorable Mr. Justice Krishan Murari for, for the values that I have learned from him. And two key values that I have learned from his lordship, I would like to just mention here. One. It is uh, many a times it happens that we as research assistants have to stay in the office later. But I would say it is not us alone. Rather, hardly there is a day when his lordship is not seen in his chamber reading his files and other business agendas till late night. And it is he from whom we draw this inspiration to work sincerely and, and give the utmost sincerity to the, to the profession. Secondly, the most important value that I have learned from his uh, lordship is humility, is humbleness and honesty. And, and his lordship in all, I, I've, I've hardly seen an interaction with his lordship, be it with the interns who have joined us for a month or two, or be it us research assistants who have been for a year or more with his lordship, that he does not uh, stress upon these values of honesty, humbleness and humility. 
and with these words uh, i i rest uh, my speech and i would like to dedicate a couplet to the esteemed presence of his lordship and that couplet is uh, of none other than our very own majaz who has written our uh, tarana taskine dile mehzoon na hui wo sayye karam farma bhi gaye taskine dile mehzoon na hui wo sayye karam farma bhi gaye is sayye karam ko kya kahiye behla bhi gaye talpa bhi gaye many thanks Thank you very much. It was indeed enriching to hear about your experiences and memories. Now, without much ado, I would like to request Honorable Mr. Justice Krishna Murari Sir to deliver and engage with this esteemed gathering on today's topic, that is, the Supreme Court and the evolution of Indian Constitution. नमस्कार आदाब एंड आई विल नॉट से अ वॉम गुड आफ्टरनून बिकॉज एज इट इज वेरी वॉम सो अ गुड आफ्टरनून आई विल चेंज सिंस आई एम इन अ यूनिवर्सिटी एज ग्रेट एज अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी एंड इन द मिडल ऑफ द स्टूडेंट्स सो आई विल चेंज द ऑर्डर ऑफ एड्रेस फर्स्ट आई विल से डियर स्टूडेंट्स then the faculty members then i would say my brother elder brother justice mithal dean faculty of law oh sorry professor namani dean faculty of law professor mohammad ashraf chairman department of law professor zaidi in charge law society and mr aman alam who is instrumental in bringing me here but in uh, with you much good words have been spoken about me by the speakers i don't know whether i am worthy of it or not professor nomani quoted from the two recent judgments yes i don't deny that there was some contribution of mine in those judgment but credit should be given to the person to whose it is due and the credit should go to our honorable the chief justice of india because he had written the judgment the credit must be given to him i had a little uh, whatever little i could contribute to it now before i come to the topic there is a little i'm little hard pressed for time since very long i had a desire to see this great university and it fructified as it had to fructify today i do feel a little sorry that i'll not be able to give as much time as i would have loved to spend with the students and the faculty of this great university but still i would say it's a profound honor for me to be amongst all of you today i really extend my thanks to aman alam and to the dean for inviting me and because of which i am here with you the topic which i intend to speak on today is supreme court and the evolution of indian constitution the topic is such that what to say of us even days would fall short but then as you know time is a factor over which no one has control but everyone has to control time factor so i would whatever little intellect i have whatever i have thought i'll share with you but before i come to the topic uh i must say as i speak to you i am reminded of having read late father of the nation mahatma gandhi ji writing about the founder father of this great institution this great seat of learning sir sayed ahmed khan to whom he referred to as prophet of education the contributions of aligarh muslim university towards national building and particularly in the field of law are well known 
the university has given several legal luminaries to the nation. Three of my great predecessors in office, namely Justice Baharul Islam, Justice Murtaza Fazal Ali, Justice R.P. Sethi, who need no introduction, especially to the members who are students of law or faculty of law, were once people of this university, as I have been told and as I have read. Even before that, Sir Shah Muhammad Suleiman, the most legendary figure, he had the distinction of being the first Indian Chief Justice of my parent high court. It makes me feel proud that today I am here where he studied once. And he was also one of the first judges of the federal court. And Simon, uh, he served as a vice chancellor of this university, I am told, from 1938 to 1941. I have read him. I have seen his photographs adoring the walls of the Museum of Allahabad High Court. But unfortunately, I never had in, couldn't have any occasion to meet him in person. Apart from above, this university has also produced several members of our Constituent Assembly, including Rafi Ahmed Kidwai, a very well-known figure, Barrister Chaudhary Haider Hussain, Qazi Sayyid Karimuddin, and Hasrat Mohani, it's former President Dr. Zakir Hussain, and former My Vice President Mr. Hamid Ansari, who are also students of this great university. The list is long and it might not be possible to mention all great names who were students uh, of this great university, associated with this university. And they are all great names in the bar and bench. I salute all of them. Last but not the least, I would like to mention one name, a name which fondly remembered, which is fondly remembered not only in this university, but also by the members in bar and bench in my parent high court. And he is none other than late Justice Sayyid Mahmood. The greatness of that great man is reflected in the words of UP's fourth and longest ever serving a very well-known legendary figure in the legal circles, Pandit Kanyal Al Mishra, who was the Advocate General, who while delivering a lecture at Allahabad High Court in its centenary year 1966 remarked, I quote, my lord, the greatness of this court, the glory of this court are in large measure due to Mahmood. If I had to select a delegate, this High Court, near the courts of our country in an international assemblage of judges, past and present, I would unhesitatingly choose Mahmood. The great contributions of Justice Mahmood, both in the foundation and nurturing of the Department of Law in its early days, as well as the development of law during his career, as one of the most remarkable judges of Allahabad High Court, will never be forgotten. I've been told that Dr. Muhammad Nasir, assistant professor of this faculty, and Ms. Samreen Ahmed, research scholar, have recently written a biography of Justice Mahmood, which is undoubtedly a long due tribute to him. Getting a little sideways, I would request the authors if they can present me with a copy of that book with the signatures on, I would like to keep it in my library and read it too. Now coming to the topic, because of the, I wanted to talk, speak a lot with all of you, the students, but then, as I said, time constraint is there. So I would li now like to move to the topic. I would first like to shed some light on the background in which of this great institution, our own Supreme Court of India came in existence. The roots of setting up 
the highest court of india dates back to early 18th century when in 1730 the king and council heard its first case from india in the matter of charles barrington versus the president and council of fort st george for the period of time with the expansion of the british empire the privy council attained jurisdiction over 150 odd colonies in both civil and criminal matters the modern day judicial committee of the privy council was set up in 1833 and continued to function as the court of last resort for indians until the abolition of its jurisdiction in 1949 the privy council heard appeals from the various high courts in british india the last indian case disposed by the privy council was N. S. Krishna Swami Iyengar v. Perumal Gaudan on 15 December 1949. With the enactment of Government of India Act 1919, which introduced limited self-government and which was, to the dismay of Indians, a far cry from the promise of self-rule, demands were made, raised for setting up a Supreme Court or a Federal Court in India itself. Eventually, after the enactment of Government of India Act 1935, the Federal Court of India was set up in 1937. The Federal Court, which was the predecessor of the Supreme Court, had jurisdiction to adjudicate upon disputes between the provinces and matters pertaining to interpretation of Government of India Act 1935. However, the Privy Council still remained the apex court. for over little over 12 years after when it was first replaced by the present supreme court and the supreme court held its first sitting within the parliament in the chamber which is known as princess chamber on 28th january 1950 and continued to function from there until it moved to its present location in 1958 one can say that the conception of both the supreme court as well as the federal court finds its root in the indian independence movement and the constitutional developments during that time hence the supreme court as guardian of the indian constitution is not only a protector of the constitutional provisions per se but also the constitutional values and ideals that our forefathers had fought for and which form the very core and spirit of our constitution and this fact stands clearly demonstrated right at the outset of the constitution in the very preamble itself i find it very appropriate to quote justice r c lahoti at this stage who said it is no exaggeration to say that preamble to the constitution of india is its spirit and backbone the preamble pervades through and inspires all the provisions of the constitution similarly justice hamidullah beg in case one and bharti thought it as clear from the preamble and provisions of part 3 and part 4 that the constitution seeks to express the principle salus populi suprema lex that is the good of masses of the citizens of the country is the supreme law embodied in our constitution prefaced as it is by the preamble which puts justice social economic and political as the first of the four objectives of our constitution according to chief justice marshall of the us supreme court a constitution is framed for ages to come and is designed to approach immortality as near as human institutions can approach a constitution therefore must grow with the growth of the nation with the philosophical and cultural development of the people who gave birth to it its interpretation must adapt to change circumstances of time and policy two things are very important for this dynamism of the constitution are the power to amend it and the power of interpretation while former comes under the ambit of the parliament the later comes in the domains of the supreme court and the high courts which are the constitutional courts in our country
it is through this power of interpretation that the Supreme Court has from time to time upheld the fundamental rights enshrined in part three of the Constitution, as well as the ideals envisaged by our founding fathers. The development, evolution and protection of rights through judicial interpretation to a large extent centers around Article 21. No law student can say that he is not aware of what Article 21 is, nor the expansion which has been given to this article by judicial interpretations of the Supreme Court. I can say this with some authority that no other article has attracted as much attraction and deliberation as Article 21 of our Constitution. Now, I would request you to recall the famous case of A.K. Gopalan versus State of Madras, the, of 1950. The argument principally in that said case revolved around equating the interpretation of the due process clause as found in the American Constitution to that of the procedure established by law as used or found in our Article 21 of our Indian Constitution. The majority opinion delivered by the then Chief Justice, Sir H.J. Kanya, refused to equate the words law in Article 21 with the principles of natural justice. And it so came to be that the law and procedure established is lex and not just. In his historic dissent, Justice Sir Sayyid Fazal Ali opined that the term personal did not qualify the term liberty and the liberty incorporated all forms of freedom, including the freedom to move about freely. He was the first to suggest a coercive interpretation of Article 19 and Article 21. After about two decades, in Minka Gandhi versus Union of India, the view, dissent, dissenting view expressed by Justice Fazal Ali was accepted and the majority judgment in A.K. Gopalan was overruled. You may also recall the famous case Golaknath versus State of Punjab, the 11 judge bench, which was fragmented, which gave a fragmented verdict 6 to 5. And the majority judgment reversed the past judgment of Sajjan Singh versus State of Rajasthan and Shankari Prasad versus Union of India. It was held that a constitutional court, constitutional amendment was indeed a law for the purposes of Article 13.2 and there was no difference between the parliament's ordinary legislative power and its inherent constituent power to pass constitutional amendments. If I remember correctly in the same year, the Supreme Court in Satwan Singh versus APO New Delhi delineated the balance between individual rights and the state interests in enforcing the law, in addition to underscoring the need for validly enacted laws delineating executive discretion. Finally, in 1973, the famous Keswanan Bharti judgment led to the basic structure doctrine, which is the basis of many later judgments of the Supreme Court authored by great and learned judges holding that the um, whatever amendment the parliament can, whatever power of amendment parliament may have, but it cannot change, alter the basic structure of our constitution. And that has led to quashing or upsetting many amendments in the constitution brought in by the legislature. What is particularly interesting is that apart from the 26th Amendment, all other constitutional amendments were affirmed and found intra virus the Constitution, thereby overruling Golaknath. Recently, the 50th anniversary of Case 1 and Bharti judgment was marked by the Supreme Court by displaying the original copies of the red petitions and other documents. And there couldn't have been a better homage to a judgment which cemented the very values on which our Indian Republic was founded. I may also draw 
your attention to another facet of this protection of fundamental rights and constitutional values is the role played by the members of the bar over the years their contribution to the development of our constitutional law and jurisprudence is monumental it would be unjust if i do not make mention of some of the legendary members of the bar including hm sirwai nani palkiwala and mc sitalwar soli sorab ji nobody connected with the field of law can deny that they have never heard their names or have never read the judgments delivered on the basis of their arguments they played a vital role in our constitutional journey let me also tell you a uh, judgment of maharashtra crisis was referred to by professor nawani the level of argument and aman is a witness to it the level of argument in that case on both the sides went to a level that the bench really had difficulty i i will just stop there i am not naming anybody it's from the record anyone can find out who appeared for which side but i can definitely say that the level of argument was so high from both the sides towards the end i would want to say to the young minds present over here that draw inspiration from these great sons of mother india that is members of the bar as well as bench and start your career in litigation the bar needs young and talented minds like you to carry on the legacy of our forebears unless there is a good bar there can't be good judgments and there would be no development of law although the initial few years in the field of litigation are turbulent this is a caution to you if you choose litigation as a field as a career the few years are very turbulent but if you can manage to sail through the rough seas of these initial years then a very bright future awaits you all then the sky is the limit and the right course in my humble opinion my suggestion for sailing in this rough area is through grim determination and commitment towards the profession at this juncture i am really reminded of my late senior shri gyanendra dharma who really shaped me and that is why i am here whatever i am it is because of his tutelage because of his training because of his strict training which he imparted to me he was so sincere towards his profession that except for the last few days when he was very critically ill and ultimately unfortunately passed away i do not remember him ever sending an illness slip or not attending the court when i used to go with him to the high court sitting in his car i didn't have any vehicle so i had to go with him he would reach at 10 o'clock the time which allahabad high court starts the closing time was 3:45 quarter to 4 i have never seen him coming back home or leaving the high court premises before quarter to 4 it was not that he was on his legs throughout the day before some court or the other but then even if he had no work supposing the board was discharged by some court or the matters were got passed over by the other side he would still be there in the court premises till 3:45 even if he had to go out i remember any function in the immediate family was designed and fixed either for a saturday or sunday because he would refuse to participate in the function uh, unless it was a holiday he would never leave his court for nearby places he would travel in the evening 
come back by night, sit in the chambers, do his next day's homework, and by 10 o'clock he was there in court. So this is the level of sincerity which is expected to make you successful. And let me tell you, young talents are, I am not saying there is anything wrong with it. There is huge gamut of work in the field of litigation and the demand of lawyers are ever increasing. With the development of new areas where you need specialized lawyers such as EDRs, that is Alternative Dis Dispute Resolution Forums, electricity Law, Sports Law, Artificial Intelligence, Space Law, Environmental Law, Competition Law. You need specialized persons for that. There is no dearth of work. It was not, the present time is not the time when I had started practice or before that. Make up your mind, put in hard work and the litigation will take you, the field of litigation will take you to a level which you maybe, which you cannot imagine. Last, I would like to say that apart from sincerity and commitment towards the profession, two values which should always be imbibed in your personality are honesty and humbleness. No matter wherever you reach in life, these ideals should always be followed by you. This is my humble advice to all the young students. Out of my experience of being in this field, for the last 42 years. These qualities will take you to great places. Besides this, I would also like to urge you to develop a habit of reading. Not only judgments, law books, but general reading. Any book worth being read, you can lay your hand on, you must read. Because constant reading keeps on adding to your knowledge and you, you never know when that idea imbibed in your mind by reading a book five years back may come in handy in some case, in some situation after five years. Actually, uh, uh, once you develop the habit of reading, this will enhance your personality vision and will also increase your argumentative ability. I wish, pray and hope through your hard work and dedication you all will take the flight, light of our great nation and this great institution forward. I would like to, as I have seen, I had a, gone to a book release function also. So I had seen everybody ends up with a couplet. So again the credit is not mine, the credit goes to Aman. But then I will I am only reading it, what he has written. Ruhe sar sayyad se roshan tera mehkana rahe, rehti dunia ta gardish mein paimana rahe. I once again thank you all for inviting me, for giving me even for a short time the opportunity to interact with you. Maybe I wish myself better luck next time I get a chance. I would love to have a question answer sessions with the young students, but then for today I beg excuse because I have some commitments which I have to keep in the evening at Delhi. Thank you all once again for allowing me to be with you even if for a short while. I wish all of you best of luck, best of future. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thanks a lot, sir, for enlightening us all with your words of wisdom. I'm pretty sure these insights of yours would go a long way in encouraging and motivating us all in not just excelling in our professional lives, but also in helping us become an asset for the society and country at large. Now, I would like to request Dean Faculty of Law, Professor Mohammed Zafar Numani, sir, to present the memento to Honorable Mr. Justice Krishna Murari, sir.
Now, I would like to call Dr. Mohammad Nasir, Assistant Professor, Department of Law, and author of the book, Sayyid Muhammad, Colonial India's Descending Judge, published by Bloomsbury, with a foreword by Justice Sudan Chudulia, Judge, Supreme Court of India, to present the book to Honorable Mr. Justice Krishna Murari, sir. These two positions will be prized position throughout my life. This will make me remember all of you. Thank you. Moving forward with the program, we are honored with the benign presence of yet another stalwart of the legal fraternity, Honorable Mr. Justice Aditya Nath Mittal, sir. Sir has been a distinguished jurist and judge in India. He completed his education from Delhi University, from where he earned his bachelor's degree in science and law, and later on pursued LLM from the same place. Sir kick-started his judgeship at the Allahabad High Court from the year 2004, and was later appointed as the Chief Justice of Meghalaya High Court. Throughout his career, Justice Mittal has been known for his deep knowledge of law, impartiality, Now, Sorry. without much ado, I would like to request Justice Aditya Nath Mittal, sir, to deliver the presidential remarks. Thank you very much. Honorable Mr. Justice Krish Murari ji, respected Professor, Professor Nomani ji, Professor Ashraf Sahab, District Judge Aligarh, Dr. Babu Saran, respected professors of this university and the faculty, including my class fellow, Mr. Zakiuddin Khairuwala. He has been my class fellow. Dear students, Certainly, it's a great pleasure for me to be here amongst you. Or I will just say that this is my dream, this is my dream, I am the dream of my dream. I did my B.Com on honors from this university, I did my LLB, I did my LLM and some other courses. At that time, this building was not in existence and our faculty was at near Union Hall, where we used to study as well as do various notorious things. Because that was, that was addressed to the canteen, where we used to go very frequently after taking contribution from each of the participants. Friends, much has been said about the Constitution and the Honorable Supreme Court, and certainly as Honorable Mr. Justice Krash Murariji has told that the most attractive section, article, of the Constitution is Article 21. Certainly, a very wide interpretation has been given to Article 21, 
right from A.K. Gopalan's case in 1950 till Medhika Gandhi's case. And certainly it has been always a point for debate that whether the life or liberty has to be curtailed in accordance with the procedure established by law or the due process of the law. There is vast difference between the procedure established by law and the due process of law. I am not a constitutional expert as Justice Krishnamurari ji is. However, I had, I had the occasion to hold benches with his lordship at Allahabad and I had learned a lot during that my tenure at Allahabad High Court. And friends, you are the future judges, future advocates, future, future legal remuneries, maybe future corporates. And the gist of the life, as Honorable Mr. Justice Krishn Murariji has told that it is the punctuality. Punctuality not only attending or coming, but also punctuality in going. If you observe the punctuality, certainly you will get the success. I am here at Aligarh. I am also associated with the Residential Coaching Academy near Sir Sajid Bobe. And I would also like to come <clears throat> and interact with you on any day, any time, as per your convenience, to guide you that how to approach the competitive examinations. It shall be my pleasure to meet and to help all of you because you are the future of the country. And in the last, jaisa couplet ki rewaaz hai, mein bhi yehi kehna chahunga, ki sitaron ko aankho mein mehfooj rakhna bahut der tak raat hi raat hogi, musafir ho tum bhi, musafir hai hum bhi, kisi mood par phir mulaqat hogi. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the inviting address. Now, I would like to request Chairman Ashraf, sir, to present the memento to Justice Aditya Nath Mittal, sir. I would like to request Dr. Muhammad Nasir, sir, Assistant Professor, Department of Law, to present the book to Honorable Mr. Justice Aditya Nath Mittal, sir. Benjamin Nisraeli rightly said, change is inevitable and change is constant. And to evolve with time is not just essential for a sanctified document as the constitution, but also for us humans. Because to evolve is to realize that you are alive and living without letting your mind and soul rust up with the things reflecting the anachronistic and rudimentary approach of the society. To put up in an allegorian way, tabdili ka rukh lazim hai har zamane mein, Tabdili ka rukh lazim hai har zamane mein nae rup mein tasulsul zindagi ka mukadma hai. In a sense, change is inevitable and necessary in every era and consistency in new forms is the foundation of life. Keeping up with the same spirit, it was under the stewardship of our respected chairman, Professor Mohammad Ashraf sir, that our faculty sailed through the storm of pandemic by metamorphizing smoothly into a technology-driven online system of teaching and learning. Sir's resilience, versatility, and efficiency to adapt to the changing times was something which was truly instrumental in ensuring that students and teachers alike don't have to suffer because of pandemic-induced constraints. Besides that, Professor Mohammad Ashraf Sir has been a person renowned for his works in the realm of criminal law, mercantile law, law of evidence, and more. 
Sir has participated in several national and international conferences and workshops and has supervised around 21 LLM dissertations. Sir has been instrumental in organizing several camps, lectures, workshops relating to national legal literacy and mass awareness programs in remote areas of Aligarh. And so now I would like to request Professor Mohammad Ashraf sir to kindly come up on the stage and deliver the vote of thanks. So I have been given this work of giving thanks to the guests, chief guests, and all the participants, and my colleagues, plus the students. Most respected chief guest of the event, Justice Krishan Murari, judge to the Supreme Court of India, Justice, Honorable Justice A.N. Mittal, former Judge Allahabad High Court, Dr. B. Sarang, District and Session Judge, Shri Ashwari Pratap Singh, my friends and my friend in Adigarh, he is the CJM in Adigarh. Plus, all the participants, my dear friend, and the present Dean, Professor M. Zafar Nomani, is the Dean Faculty of Law, and all the colleagues, as well as the students. Thank you all of you for your patient hearing and we have earned a lot from these lectures. So I give my thanks to each one of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. With this, we have come to the denouement of the program. It has indeed been a wonderful afternoon with wonderful audience and noteworthy guests. So now, as per the traditions of Aligarh Muslim University, we would like to end the program with the playing of University Tarana by the University Tarana team, which would be followed by the national anthem. Thank you very much. Thank you. 